Broadcasting from the heart of rural America in beautiful St. Joseph, Missouri, this is Angus Talk. I'm Doug Medlock, your host, bringing you the latest in-depth conversations about the future of the beef business from the American Angus Association. With us today is Dr. Neville Spear of the University of Western Kentucky. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. A beautiful campus down there, Big Red, uh, maybe 10 years ago, took out a bunch of parking lots and put in green areas. It's like working in a state park down there, isn't it? Absolutely. It's one of the most beautiful campuses in the country. We're very proud of it. Dr. Neville Spear of the University of Western Kentucky and recently uh, wrote a white paper entitled Crossbreeding, Considerations and Alternatives in an Evolving Market. And uh, this has opened some eyes in the, with producers uh, looking at uh, crossbreeding out there. Yeah, I think that's right. O- ultimately, we wanted to sim- stimulate some discussion out there in the industry, and, and um, uh, we knew that something like this certainly would. But ultimately, what we want to do is have producers become more objective or at least think about being very objective in what they're doing relative to their management capabilities and matching that with their genetic decisions. The rule of thumb the last 40 years has been to crossbreed to maximize production. But you're saying producers are approaching their programs differently these days? I, I think we're really saying crossbreeding works, and we, we recognize the science very well. It works, though, only when it's done well. We begin to kind of create some problems for the beef industry and, and our business when it's not done well. And then ultimately what's happened is I think that we've seen producers sort of selecting towards more of a straight breeding kind of a system. And and ultimately what the paper does is ask the question, why is that going on? Why are they ignoring these paradigms that we recognize in terms of the science? And why are they ignoring those paradigms? Well, I think there's probably two kind of aspects to this. One is the overall change in our business as we talk about the increase in, in value signals that have worked their way back into to the system. And so ultimately what happens is we've got better supply chain coordination and consu- uh, producers are responding to those price signals very well and, and ultimately what's happened is they've pulled through a specific kind of product. The other thing that's happened is that the cost structure in our business has changed at the cow-calf level and along with that also labor constraints and what have you. And so the decision making gets a little bit different, not only internally or from a micro perspective within our segment, but then also across the entire supply chain. And then also what happens is is that we've seen producers really begin to consolidate. And then we've also seen sort of the, the other side of that. So we've squeezed out of the middle sort of the middle-sized cow-calf producer, the 200-cow kind of operator. And so what happens is is that labor constraints are are very much constrained as you get either larger or smaller. And and ultimately what happens and what we discuss in the paper is that uh, cows are not the primary source of income in most operations in the United States. I mean, either we have lots of cows and then they're part of a larger operation where we may be farming or doing something else, or I may run, for example, 30 to 50 cows, but then I also have a job somewhere. So cows become sort of a part-time kind of um, obligation, if you will. In either situation, the labor is allocated elsewhere. But as people keep that herd size down, quality becomes more and more important, probably. Absolutely. I mean, we want to then <laughs> respond to those kinds of market signals to that maximize revenue in some way or another, and that's absolutely right. And ultimately what happens is that producers oftentimes don't necessarily look at profitability per se. They look at revenue. They respond very strongly to revenue signals. So they've been, had lots of inducements away from a commodity-based type of system in the last 20 to 25 years. So crossbreeding, not necessarily bad, but keep track of what you're doing. That's absolutely right. Crossbreeding is not necessarily bad. In fact, we know it's very favorable. The science is very, very clear on that, and the paper in no way takes any contention against that. Ultimately, what happens, though, is we've changed the market signals. Maybe we need to put that in a little different context than we traditionally have done. But then when it comes comes time to keep track of what you're breeding to breeding, 
a database like the one at the American Angus Association has got to be helpful. No question. And that's one of the things that the paper also discusses is the power of, of genetic information. And we've done a much better job of being able to make better genetic decisions because of that information in the last 20 years, 30 years. And, and so we've been able to make huge strides in genetic advancements that weren't available say back in the 70s when crossbreeding really was at sort of the height of popularity. We're talking with Dr. Neville Spear of the University of Western Kentucky, and this is Angus Talk. We'll be right back. It's time to revive rural America, to help our small town communities move forward, to keep our farms and ranches on a path of prosperity. That's what the Angus Foundation is all about. Each year, we work hard to help kids attend college, providing scholarships to tomorrow's leaders. We invest in research that's critical to our livelihood. And we create educational opportunities for America's cattle producers, ensuring their continued professional development. Won't you help us? Contact the Angus Foundation today. Welcome back to Angus Talk, brought to you by the American Angus Association. Our guest today, Dr. Neville Spear of the University of Western Kentucky. And doctor, we've heard a lot about value-based marketing. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, value-based marketing really has been the transition where the emphasis increasingly has been on the end user, the consumer, if you will. And ultimately what happens is, is that we have retail outlets and, and or restaurants that uh, desire specific types of programs, specific types of product, and then ultimately they push price signals back up into the system. And um, that really becomes very important because they need to have some kind of supply continuity assurance. And then ultimately the other side of that becomes the issue of consistency. So it's kind of a double-sided type of issue. Um, but that's what happens when we have value-based programs. We're trying to induce supply because of price signals. So, Dr. Spear, as consumers become more aware of the benefits of quality and they're more aware of what they're eating, demand for commodity beef has remained relatively flat when you compare it to demand for certified Angus beef. Yeah, that's, that's correct. What's happened is the consumer's gotten used to a, a relatively consistent and high-end product and then begins to demand that. And ultimately, that creates a very strong pull through, especially as we talk about the upper end of choice and then into the prime product. Um, and, and some really good brand new research out uh, done with NCBA and, and the Beef Checkoff and then Daryl Tatum at CSU, kind of documenting that in a little different way. But as you look at the upper two thirds of the choice product into prime, just far more consistent and has much higher consumer acceptance as you get versus the lower third of choice. So as we look at straight breeding versus cross breeding and take into account the challenges and opportunities of the future, what should commercial producers be thinking about today to get their breeding programs in order? Well, I think what's going to happen is that we are going to continue to see differentiation in the marketplace. Um, we, we set down on this path away from a commodity mindset and, and the um, evolving uh, structure of alliances and value-based programs and branded products and however you want to describe that, lots of different ways to do that, just going to continue to flourish out there in the industry. And that's really been very, very favorable. And as we've discussed before in, in some other venues, um, as we look back at, at uh, the last couple of years and coming through this financial crisis, one would think that probably beef demand would have suffered, but actually it's held together very well. And that's ultimately because of all of the work we've done in terms of these um, value-added programs and alliances and begun to create some consistency in the end product that we've been able to hold beef demand together. So we've talked about consumer awareness of the product, and we've talked about uh, high quality and how keeping track of what you're breeding uh, can, uh, can affect the product and the outcome. And then where does this leave us in the future, 10, 15 years down the road? What does the beef business look like? I think the beef business looks uh, like an industry that uh, continues to flourish in the way that it's going. We continue to kind of seek out uh, producer uh, programs uh, that have end user specifications in mind. 
So we become much more of a network-oriented system as we talk about high-quality beef and, and also doing that in a very efficient manner. Um, and ultimately, you begin to see producers that are, that are much more concerned about risk management and, and making good decisions in order to kind of create viability around their ranch, around their farms, and then as that ties into the rural economy. People out there are a lot smarter than they used to be about what they're eating and where it comes from, and, and that all plays into our hand profit-wise, right? There's, there's no question. There's much more awareness and much more interest about where food comes from. And then on the other side of that is that consumers have much more access to information about all kinds of food. Sometimes that's favorable and sometimes that's unfavorable. But ultimately, if we can deliver the right product to them in terms of meeting their demands, that's nothing but positive. Dr. Neville Spear, thanks for joining us. The University of Western Kentucky. And if you'd like to read a copy of his paper, visit www.angus.org or contact the American Angus Association at 816-383-5100. Thanks for joining us today.